the topic we will have is One Army, the new publisher by Jamie, uh, Jamie Pizarro of Bull Runner will present the subject matter and th she will be joined later by two panelists and the moderator of the session. Um, Jamie Pizarro, uh, Jamie Chrysostom Pizarro is better known as the Bull Runner. She's the woman behind the popular running blog, thebullrunner.com, which started as a journal of her passion for running and later grew into one of the most credible and widely followed online resources for Filipino runners. In 2008, bullrunner.com bagged the only two awards in the sports category of Philippine blog awards. The following year, Jamie published the Bull Runner magazine, the first free magazine, especially for runners. In 2010, she launched the Bull Runner Dream Marathon, the only marathon in the world which caters exclusively to beginner marathons. Online registration for the fourth Dream Marathon for 2013 closed in a mere 55 minutes. Awesome. Jamie's a passionate runner, having participated in races all over the world. She has finished nine marathons, including Hong Kong Marathon, Singapore Marathon, ING New York City Marathon, Berlin Marathon, London Marathon. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Jamie Pissar. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, okay, I'm not a techie, I'll tell you now. So the, the talk ahead of me kind of got me scared. Um, I'm a blogger, I'm a runner, and I'm here to talk about the one-man army. Okay, when you think about armies, you think war and blood and guns and dead bodies <laughs> but honestly this is me this is how my blog started this was me in 2007 with my two kids that's my home office I work from home I'm a graphic designer at that time and one day on my birthday when I turned when I turned 30 years old I sat down in our dining table and I said, I'm gonna create a blog about this new found love I had for a new sport. Never in my life had I been athletic. So I was 30 already. Never got into sports as I grew up. I was um, like a gym rat who only went to the gym really when she needed to lose weight. I had a treadmill at home, that treadmill, which I just walked on every other day. But six months prior to that day when I, I was in the dining table, I just increased the speed on the treadmill. And within two months, I had learned to run by myself. So I had found something new, something I was so passionate about. And in 2007, there was no runner on the street. There were no races you read about online or in magazines or newspapers. There was just no one. And I felt like I just had to write about it or tell someone about it because no one would really react. My husband didn't know. My friends didn't know about it. So I created my own logo since I'm a graphic designer within 15 minutes. I wrote a short blog post on the about page uh, within like 30 minutes to an hour I posted it and it was called theballrunner.com and my background prior to getting married and having kids was I was a brand I was in brand marketing for a pharmaceutical company so I knew my marketing so I did what I knew best as a marketing person I emailed all my friends <laughs> and I told them, guys, you have to comment because it's so embarrassing. No one's written anything here. 
Okay, so within that week, I had like 10 people reading the blog, which was great. That's awesome. Okay, so it was born out of passion, really. I wrote the blog mainly as an outlet. My second goal was to make it a resource for runners because I knew nothing about running, but I would log on and find so many running websites from the US. If you wanted to know about a race locally, you had to sit down in the every day and read the newspapers and look for the next race possible. So I wanted it to be a great resource for runners as well. So I created the blog. And this was like my favorite quote about running. In fact, in the first uh, design of the blog, that was always there. It just really spoke about my passion for everything running. Oprah Winfrey, when she ran her first marathon, she said that running is the greatest metaphor for life because what you put into it is really what you get back. And it's true. The more you train, the better you get. It's really just that. That's why average people now can get into the sport because just as long as you work hard and you're determined, you can eventually finish your goal race. With blogging, it's just the same. It's hard work as well. I think people think, non-bloggers will think, oh, all you really do is rant or talk about all the great things that happened in your day. But really, when, the, when you have regular readers already, which is what happened to me after my friends told their friends about it, um, like within six months, the blog just blew up. Uh, it just went, it exploded together with the running boom of 2008 and 2009. So I was getting a lot of hits, a lot of page views, and all of a sudden, my personal blog had turned into like a running resource, a running magazine, or a running newspaper even. It became the source of info for all things running. So it became work, but the thing is, when you create a blog out of passion, and your passion is running, which was mine, it never really feels like work. Work was play, play was work. So the more I ran, the more I had things to write about and post on the blog. So I would write about anything and everything running. I would join so many races. In fact, like I think in 2008 and 2009, every weekend was a race. I got to travel abroad thanks to the blog. So I got to do my dream race, which was in New York, which as a side story, I thought was really impossible. I mean, when I sat down to write the first blog post on theballrunner.com, I wrote there, my dream is to run the New York Marathon. That was in 2007. And I thought, how can I possibly run 42K in New York and have my husband pay for it? <laughs> impossible, right? Um, the thing is, in 2010, I was able to run 42K already, which was like, wow, out of this world. And Gatorade sponsored me, which my husband and I were both happy about. And it was just something that told me that, wow, nothing is really impossible. So that's me and my bodyguards in New York. And last year, I got to run, run Berlin and then London this year. My goal is really to run the ma marathon majors of the world, so hopefully by next year I get that done. But really, what happened with the blog was that it was just all fun. It was all about me writing about myself and my adventures. The thing is, the problem with blogging, especially for a person like me who doesn't like talking about herself too much, is that it gets boring, it just becomes narcissistic at a certain point, and you just get tired of seeing your own pictures all the time on your blog, right? And I felt like I had to do something more. In 2009, oh, that's one more picture. Okay. In 2009, since I'm a graphic designer, 
and I'm a write I was a writer as well. I felt like everything was in place for me to just create and expand the Bull Runner into a magazine. Actually, I did this all within one week. The, I, I mean, I could easily design anything, layout and everything. The, the advertisers I had known personally because everyone in the community I practically knew by then. So I just got people, contributors, to write articles, got my good friend who's a runner to photograph all the photos, and within one week we were going to print. And the first Bull Runner magazine was out. It was the first free running magazine in the country. We are, my goal for this was, number one, I, I'm, I'm, I may confuse you because I'm a blogger, and it's kind of, you feel like you're going backward by going back into print. But for me, I felt like it was the right move, number one, because in the running world, some of them, some of the runners didn't actually go online. They would, they would have no access to a calendar of races. And all these runners would be all in one place, in one event, and if you could just give them something to tell them about all the races, to give them info about running, and to tell them about my blog online as well, and they could possibly go online and look at it, then that would be great. So I created the Bull Runner magazine all by myself at in the start. <laughs> Thankfully, I learned to get a staff. Okay, so that's been we've been doing that since 2010, and until now we've had like a, it's a bi-monthly issue. So we've had a, a several issues already. And aside from the magazine, of course. You go on Twitter, you go on Facebook, you go on Instagram. We have an e-group as well for newsletters. Um, we practically reach out to everyone as much as we can. But really, it's the blog that has been and always will be the main site for everything. Okay. Now, this is where it all gets interesting. When I started the blog, like I told you, it was all about me, but as it, as it went on, I learned that just by telling people about my stories about running, I was actually inspiring them to take it up as well, mainly because I'm not an athlete, I'm not a celebrity, I'm just like you, I'm just like everyone else. And what I did was really to just pick up the sport and just go do it, go out and do it. And so, in 20, what year was this? In 2009, I ran my first marathon. For those of you who don't run, it's a 42K distance. It's really the ultimate test for the human body, for a runner especially, because usually at a 32K distance, you're fine. I mean, even if you didn't train, you can practically, cr practically crawl your way through a 32K. But the last 10K, no matter how prepared your body is, it really just takes a toll on you, all the running. And so, in so much as it's a test of your body and your, your physical limits, it really is a test of your mind as well, your mental toughness. And that's why the marathon is really a big thing for runners. Now, in 2009, I ran my first marathon, and that was a big deal. And when I crossed the finish line, I felt like my world had changed. As in, the minute I crossed that finish line, I felt like I was a stronger, more empowered person. And the, I, I did that in the afternoon, and until nighttime when I was in bed, with my husband, I remember telling him, I have to get people to do this as well. And even if I was a blogger, I wrote about it, but still, I needed people to do it because you just can't put into words the magic that you experience when you run a marathon. So, the next week after I crossed that finish line, I met with Jim Lafferty, who I didn't know personally, but I had heard of them, him in the running circles, and we heard that 
he could get people in PNG. He was the GM of PNG at that time. He could get people in PNG and train them to run the Milo Marathon at that time. And so we sat down once or twice talking about all things running because he's a marathoner as well. And one day in his living room, he says, let's do a marathon. I said, no way. I'm a blogger. I'm, I don't organize events. But the thing is, everything fell into place within a week. And within a week, the Bull Runner Dream Marathon was born. That was in 2010. So it was the first and only marathon in the world that caters to first timers, meaning people who have never run a 42K. It, it gave people who knew nothing about running the chance to become heroes from zero to hero, really. And we train you fully from start to finish. And these are pictures from the marathon from 2010, 2011, all the previous races. And what happened was that, that's Christine Jacob running her first marathon. And this is the last runner who ran the last marathon. Um, she's paced by our volunteers because the marathon also encourages volunteers, people who pay it forward to non-runners, uh, to runners, I'm sorry. So what the, the event did was really to give a life and the heart to the blog. Because in the blog, I can talk about running as much as I can, and I meet a lot of people, and I get to help a lot of people online. But when it came to this marathon, I met them face to face, and I saw tears and laughter and celebration and triumph and all the human emotions in that finish line. And I don't think you can replace that for anything else. So in a way, the blog, the magazine, um, all the social media that I do, and the event all work together in order to solidify really my advocacy for running. It's become an advocacy. I never knew it would be. I mean, in the start, it was just all really just talk. Now it's become something bigger than me, something that even if I wanted to let go of sometimes, I just can't because I feel like there's a responsibility to help change people's lives. This is how we marketed the marathon this year. I just released this teaser a month before we opened registration. And if you see the blue bars, in 2013, we gave 800 slots only, and it was gone in 55 minutes. In 2014, 900 slots were taken in 37 minutes. And our race fees actually double any of the race fees locally. But no one complains, I think because they know that it's worth it. Uh, you can't really re replace the experience of your first marathon. So the, this is the picture of the first batch. We were 300 runners. This is the picture of the last batch. That's actually just half. And that's in our send-off party. What's happening now is that it's really had Gro it's grown into a, it's have a, it had a life of its own already. People will defend the marathon for me. They will protect it with their lives. They've grown friends and grown running groups and they've become better runners all because of this event. It's not about me anymore and I feel great about that. It's about the event and how it's changed their lives. So my roles as, I'm trying to think of the one man army theme. And really, in the start, I was really one woman trying to do so many things, when really it's just me being myself, being given the opportunity through the blog to have a voice. And with that voice, I was able to change people's lives. So if you ask me what the ROI is of everything that I've done through the years because of the blog, sure, it pays the bills. 
Yeah, um, it's given me free trips. It's, it's given me a lot of friends in running and in life. And most of all, to see all these faces in the finish line of that race and to see how they can triumph over their own obstacles, how they first thought that they couldn't even run, and then they find themselves running 42K. Um, to see couples running together and strengthening their bond together, it's made a world of difference for me. Um, it's told me that this little um, stay-at-home mom can actually do some good through this little online platform that she had. And if I just continue on and just work on it, then I think I can do even a bigger difference in the world. So I'd like to end this talk with this quote. It says, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. And then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Let me call the two other panelists, Candice Lopez Quimpo of Homegrown, um, JV Fernandez of 8 and they'll be joined by the session moderator, Carlo. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Uh, grabe. That was more, that was just as inspirational as uh, informational no, for everybody. Uh, so, siguro to kick things off, uh, baka our two guests here can also uh, give a quick intro uh, to how they started blogging. Uh, what your sites are, uh, k k very quick lang. So, baka JV, we can start with Hello, you. Hello, uh, my name is JV Fernandez. I've been blogging for more than seven years. Um, you might know my, my blog at abuglife.com. I'm also the editor-in-chief of a website called eightlist.ph. Hi, I'm Candice Kimpo. I'm actually a frustrated blogger. <laughs> That's the first thing I told the person who invited me. I run a website called homegrown.ph, which is a publication that aims to empower small entrepreneurs, but um, with a lot of props to bloggers because they've led, they really opened the doors to digital things. I'm a frustrated blogger, but a lot of the people who work for me actually have their own blogs and I count on their credibility as well. Uh, so, Sigur, just to, to keep the ball rolling now, see, Jamie really zeroed in on the importance of passion. Uh, when you want to start blogging and you start writing. So maybe uh, Candice and Jamie can just quickly share your thoughts on that. Is it something that's really critical for a blogger to have that? Is it something that will power you through? And baka you can just share your comments on that one. Maybe Candice, I mean, start. about passion. Passion or purpose, I think you can interchange both of them. Because when we started Homegrown, actually when Daniela Yaptin Chai, she's our publisher, she talked to me about starting a publication about entrepreneurship. We really had to zero in on what our point was and what our purpose was. and. You can always say, okay, our passion is to empower, our passion is to create um, more opportunities or to open doors for people, but you have to have a purpose as well. So we didn't have the time, because if you put up a publication as opposed to a blog, because we could have started as a blog. Um, it has to be passionate, it has to be passionate in the beginning because there's no revenue. <laughs> There's no <laughs> right? I mean, you, you run on... So there's no <laughs> revenue at the start. <laughs> you run on negative. So you have to p power up through a different thing. The values, the passion, and the purpose. Okay, JV. Um, I came from the publishing industry. I was a tech editor for three years. I was also a food photographer. and So basically, I, I, I did the whole 360 with the media. Um, I left and put up a site my blog because 
Well, the main reason was I didn't want to have my content being read by an editor anymore. I wanted to publish <laughs> my own stuff. Because it's long, eh. Shucks, I'm write some write a column now. It appears next week. But ah, no, I can't. I, wa- I want it to uh, appear now. So I guess it's um, it's part of my, you know, I, I'm very impatient. So <laughs> that's, how, that's how my site actually started. And it, it came to a point where I wrote, well, I was writing about technology. Uh, and right now I'm... I'm undergoing a demographic change because, you know, when my son was born, oh no, fatherhood. So I'm starting to look at diaper ads. So, <laughs> eh, 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 and looking at, uh, like, I'm starting, to, instead of comparing phone specs, I'm now comparing what's the best car seat to get. And I have an Excel spreadsheet which I present to my wife. And <laughs> look at this, this is the best car seat for this age. And so I realize that the passion is still there. It's just, it's just attuned to a different. You see, it could be tech, it could be being a dad, it could be, well, my, I also am a scuba diver and take, I, I take underwater photos. And I think um, passion is important because it's really what fuels me. I mean, the, if I didn't like what I was doing, then the site would have been dead a long time ago. I've been doing this for, what, seven, eight years already? So Carter. that's really the secret sauce, no? From the things of blogging, if you'd say about it, it's really the passion. So, thinking of that, any the three of you can answer na lang, no? Uh, siguro a lot of the people here are wondering, parang, is it too late uh, to get into to blogging or publishing or independent publishing? Baka ang dami ng people owning that particular niche. Yeah. For example, for running, and, uh, nandun na si Bullrunner, may, pwede pa ba ako magtayo? <laughs> Or for technology, pwede pa ba ako? Nandiyan na si JV. Or yung eight list or, diba? or homegrown. Parang, is, is there still space for more independent publishers? So any of the three of you, or all three of you can answer. Ladies first. <laughs> uh, well, I think it depends on your goals for putting up a blog. I mean, if you intend to profit from it, then in my field, in the field of running, they're like, running blogs born every day. <laughs> um, and in fact, I've been blogging for seven years already. Yeah. Um, every year, so there are frequent press cons for races and all. Every year, it's a whole new set of bloggers. There are only two of us who have remained all through the years. That's Takba.ph and me. And they're not even a blog. They're a website. So, but I have new friends <laughs> every year because <laughs> um, it depends on your goals. You will stay if it's a personal blog. If it's something for profit, then you must know the field well. You must study it as a business. I mean, it's like when you uh, create a new product, you have a focus group discussion. You study the market and everything. If you're going to go into a blog as a business, then do the same. Because you can't enter a field like running, which is saturated, and try to be on top, just like everyone else is trying to trying to do right now. OK. Do you guys want to add anything? Yeah, because the internet's really, really noisy. And it's really crowded in some ways. But if you want to start something, I think, yes, it's possible. Um, Jamie already mentioned in her talk that it takes a lot of hard work to publish, whether it's a blog or a website. And I think people who get into blogging think that you know you rant and you publish and then you're done. But there's actually a lot of planning. I've seen a lot of bloggers with editorial calendars that you don't see because you think that they're just. And you can be as impulsive as you want, but if you're thinking long term, that's how you can. You have to enter thinking of a you know some sort of vision, even if it's loose. So there is space, but you kind of have to make space for yourself as well. JV, do you want to add anything? Uh, I think to know whether you should start your own personal site or uh, any publication, I think the first thing that you should have is frustration. You should be frustrated because it hasn't been done yet. Sana may ganito. Sana may site na something that like, like I, I put up eight list because I wanted a list site in the Philippines that was locally owned, and talk, talking about things that were not really being talked about. Like, for example, I've always wondered, what are the eight things older than Juan Ponce and Rile? And no, as of no, today, no, it's no, still no, one no, of our top no. rating articles with several thousand share, shares. Why eight? Um, why eight? Because 10 is too much and five is too little. Eight is a good number. And at least, um, you know the problem with list sites like BuzzFeed, for example, they give you 27 reasons why, and so and so and so and you're scrolling down 
animated gifs. Ang tagal magload, di ba? So, at least eight, everything's eight. You're there for eight, and you leave, tapos. So, our commitment to you is, one scroll down, you're done. And it, it's a nice format, para lang. And also because it was my goal to own the number eight in Google. So, now when you Google the number eight, lumalabas si eight list if you're my friend in Google+. Plus. So, yun. Okay, talk about <laughs> goal setting, ah. Okay, now you, you, you guys mentioned earlier na parang yun nga, um, it can also lead to business, uh, to, to paying the bills. So, siguro a lot of people are also wondering, ano ba yung mga business models when it comes to, to blogging? In particular to you guys, if you don't mind sharing, is it still advertising? Is it still Google AdSense? Uh, is it selling products, creating events? Ano ba yung sa tingin yung perfect mix of uh, things that will make, earn you guys money? Free food? Joke. Joke lang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can go first or um, I run Google AdSense and I run a few other you know, third party linking uh, um, ad, ad, ad buying uh, platforms but through the years I've, I've really realized that the best ads are direct ads talaga. and that has to do with building a relationship with your client talaga, through the years and it, you know it's, it, was, it was basically me looking at the industry and saying shucks do I really need to to put up a Google AdSense. I mean, it's still there. It just pays for my phone bill. But the, the main reason, the main source of, of, of revenue talaga would be um, direct ads from tech clients who I've um, you know, been uh, contacted since what, for the past 10 years, so including my days in, in media. So it's really building that relationship that's very important. Um, but it was not the goal of my site. My goal is really just to write, to write and write and write because I left print and I wanted to go online. And it was like that for at least four years before it even started to make a little bit of money. Um, so four years you were negative. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say negative because it wasn't, it wasn't the business. You only say it's negative. Pag it's a negosyo, yeah, diba? It was never a. It was never a business for me. It was really just me writing about things I've always wanted to say, and I thought that I had I was making sense, naman, and dumadami naman ng readers, so <laughs> I must be doing something right, right? right? Actually, feeling ko maraming blurs, ganun. They get that feeling eventually na parang, uy, dumadami na. Maybe I'm really making sense here. Diba? But anyway, <laughs> how about you guys? Do you, do you want to share um, something about business models? For mine, models? it would also be direct ads. Um, same with JV. You, you get into the blog and you don't really hope for much because you just want to write about, your, about running, like for me. Um, so I never really had like great sheets and you'd send it to advertisers, n unli not unlike my magazine. Because the magazine, you really have to sell it to advertisers because the cost is so high to print. So my goal for that was really to just to recover the printing costs. Now for the blog, there's really no cost. So it was always through direct ads and only from advertisers who would inquire, even until now actually. I never really went out of my way to look for advertisers. It's just that if you're into something and you're so involved in the community, you really get to know the advertisers well and they see, they learn to see your value as an influencer in the community and they will be the ones to get in touch with you and place ads there. And similarly, if they trust in you through the years, they will stay for like seven years. I've had ads that have stayed there and I love it because you get to just continue to write about your passion without having to worry. About the bills. <laughs> no, not even. About like, you it's know how there are paid posts and you have yeah, to. Correct. Well, always naman, I'll accept sometimes if it's like something I believe in. But I don't like kasi yung mga hard sell or whatever. So when it's an ad, you know that it's doing its job and you're doing your job and both parties are happy, diba? So it was really just to cover costs. Even for the marathon, actually, it's only to get advertisers and sponsors to cover the costs so that you can put out a great product. Yun lang yun, not really to get filthy rich, <laughs> diba? <laughs> okay, but um, homegrown hasn't been online we're, pro we're turning 10 months in September, so we're still n going through our way about the revenue model. We do have ads, but that's not our source. We 
like to think of ourselves as content creators. I'm actually not a one-man army, although I did spearhead the editorial content. I'm going on leave soon, so I have no managing editor to take care of a lot of things for me. But um, as content creators, because we're looking at what other websites are doing as well, not locally, but abroad, and there are rate sheets. Um, I know the problem with hard sell, because even with us, we don't want to look like we're you know, I, I'm not a big fan of advertorials. I'm not a big fan of, you know, trying to push products in people's faces because we want to be a resource website. So content creation is like a partnership with a sponsor so that we are able to find a shared value and then they pay for the space and, you know, be relevant to our readers without turning them off. So, yeah, we're putting out the rate sheet soon. <laughs> Okay, so rate sheets soon down from home group. <laughs> but they want to plug. But anyway, um, talking about that brand ambassadorships, it's it's coming very very uh, popular these days in the industry, wherein a lot of companies have several uh, brand ambassadors to to amplify social media campaigns. And we know for a fact that a lot of these companies have bloggers as well. No, either not just in the telco space, no, talaga all over, kahit multinationals and FMCG d does it. So maybe we can just get your thoughts on that. What do you think about yun nga, companies uh, tapping uh, bloggers specifically uh, to be their brand ambassadors, to push out content, uh, to, to retweet and post tweets and Facebook posts? Maybe you can just share some of your ideas about that. Um, like I said earlier, I think the brand amb ambassadorships come because for brands that are well immersed in a certain field, they know who the influencers are. They know who are the peop who are the ones that the people listen to and follow. So uh, I think it's a great thing because, uh, w especially for bloggers like us, <laughs> I mean, it's it's a collaboration really. <clears throat> both of both the blogger and the advertisers get to work together to endorse a specific product which actually is something that you believe in so like for me i i really i have received um brand ambassadorship offers and the great thing with it is that it's a product that i usually use it's actually something that i believe in and the company will get back in return not my endorsement um, and at the same time, usually they cover also all my other events. So they hit my blog online, they hit print, my magazine, they hit events, which is my marathon, which also has within the marathon program itself, five run clinics and five <coughs> running talks, each having 400 runners attend per session. So, I mean, just to tap me alone, you would cover actually most of the runners who are serious and committed and who will invest that money to buy a watch or to buy the, ne the next running shoe, <coughs> which is a brand that I would actually you tell you then to buy personally if we were just talking. Diba? So it works. It works for everyone. JV? I think I think a lot of times in the industry uses the word brand ambassador very loosely because hey can you be brand ambassador for so and so product what does that mean wala parang we'll give you a free product tapos promote it eh hindi pa lumalabas so eh, the problem there kasi is I think a, a real brand ambassador is someone who has actually been using that product for a while or is very familiar with that product and even with even if you do not get him or her um, he still would be using it um, I, I think the in my case the best example they got Nokia got me for a, a brand ambassadorship for a service and um, this was way back in 2010 um, I had been using the service abroad actually uh, the, the, the foreign version for a, siguro a year and a half already and it turns out that during the briefing ako po yung nag brief sa agency kung ano yung produkto because they didn't really know so ganun eh. so my I w it was me uh, showing that I really loved what uh, this product and tell him no no that's not what it is this is what it is so I think that's not to say that um, I was better huh? all I'm saying is that it really showed that I really liked what it was and what it stood for 
Na I would I was so excited that I was the one leading the briefing already. So I think that's something to consider when getting a brand ambassador. No, I think it's really about authenticity. I think is the most important thing. I think that's a very good point. No, and to, to those who are still working with agencies and client side uh, listening to us today, uh, maybe that's really something that we should take into consideration when we pick uh, brand ambassadors. That it's just not the number of followers or readers, but also you have to take into consideration if they've been users of your product as well. No? So I think it's a very, very good point, uh, and it's uh, really good to take home no, for, for people. Now, we're about to wrap up, but i just like to throw one last uh, point, no? and I think this is very interesting. One of my favorite uh, speakers and authors, his name is Gary uh, Vaynerchuk. Uh, you should check his book out, really nice. Uh, he said this eh, in one of his talks that uh, all companies are now media companies with the age of social. And he was talking about how the gatekeepers of content started with traditional media and then moved to new media. When I say new media, we're talking about the bloggers uh, and the online publishers. Um, but his, his next theory is that it will go back or it will go to the brands, to the companies wherein companies will start to have their own editorial teams, they'll be churning out their own content, uh, they'll be having multimedia videos, kind of like having a Rappler built into your system, into your company. So do you think, is that something that's going to happen here in the Philippines anytime soon? And would, do you think it would, I don't know, threaten uh, bloggers in a way because they would be starting to pour the budget instead to their operations as opposed to getting others. Uh, this is just random thoughts, no? So baka you guys can just share what you think about that one. Anybody can start. I think it's gonna be a good move for brands to do that, but it's not gonna be as easy as it sounds. Putting up an editorial um, arm, editorial product is difficult. And I have a feeling if that's going to happen, you are going to ta tap people who've been doing it whether we come from traditional or digital or both. And there's gonna be some sort of synergy or outsourcing. It has to, you have to start with the experts and you can't create something thinking that your marketing arm can do it on their own. So there's gonna be a shift somewhere. I don't see why not, but they're not gonna be able to do it by themselves. That's a good point. JV? I think it's happening right now. Um, a lot of fellow journalists I know are being pirated by, well, by agencies first. Because it's happening in the agency side, I see more. They, we now have uh, agencies that have editorial, a, a, a team talaga, and his name, he, the, the titles are like editorial head or head of content. So I think the industry term for that is content marketing, precisely. Uh, moving on to the brand side, it's going to happen also. The problem is, um, it's going to be, with the brand as your publisher now, it will encounter the same problems that journalists have with their publishers. So there's always going to be that internal conflict. Uh, th that's my prediction. Second point would be brands strive for ubiquity. So even if it's your brand saying the same message, care of uh, its own internal staff, you still need the ubiquity of the crowd to, ver to, ver to, to, to verify. For example, look at the telcos and look at the big FMCGs. They have one million plus plus likes on Facebook. They don't need more followers. What they need is validity and, and people to, to validate that, yeah, this so-so service is okay or this so-so service is not okay. That's why citizen journalists and maybe as yes, bloggers exist for that because it's, it's, the, it's these telcos that drive traffic to the bloggers, not the other way around anymore. What they're looking for is to verify whether tama nga sila, right? That, make, that makes a lot of sense no, before I give the, give the mic to Jamie. Uh, actually, a lot of bloggers these days, di ba nga, they, they send emails pa to the PR firm saying na parang, oh, baka the brand can post our, <laughs> our blog post on their Facebook page. But I think that's a very good point, no, that the traffic uh, sometimes is not really anymore from the blogger to the site eh, of, the, of, the, of the company. It's really tama. That's a really good point, Jamie, no, on validity. And I think that's another thing that we should add to the take home. Uh, other than the th first two points that we mentioned earlier. Okay, Jamie? Um, I think both can coexist. Um, you can have brands writing about their own products, but the thing is it's going to end up like an ad. It's going to be hard sell. Whereas 
in my experience as a blogger dealing with companies, multinationals, what they want to do when they tap bloggers is to get into the community led by that blogger. So it's the whole tribe principle. And if you're a brand that creates your own website or Facebook page, yeah, you can have all the likes. But if you don't get into the community and find out exactly how it works and what they like and who they follow, then it's just going to be like a print ad, um, like a box ad or whatever on a website. Whereas top the, blo the blogger, you get in, um, you get in involved, you can interact through the blogger. So both can coexist and both will probably um, achieve different goals. So that's what I think. Okay, so that I think it's a very good panel. Uh, if we take a look at the, the main points, one, passion, uh, to drive everybody, especially at the beginning when there's no revenue yet and you really need to keep on churning out content. Then for the agencies out there and the companies when selecting brand ambassadors, we have to do our due diligence to make sure that the brand ambassadors are actually using the product um, in the first place and not just getting anybody and everybody. And maybe food for thought, like what, what JV mentioned earlier, it's, it's, nice to kn it, it's good to think about that idea where in companies are turning to bloggers to look for validity more than just to drive traffic <laughs> to their site. It's very, very interesting. No? Those are very interesting points. And I'd like to thank everybody, uh, Candice, JV, uh, Jamie, for that very interesting panel. Let's give them a warm hand of applause, please. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.